Welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. This is Metal Mike, and in this episode, we talk with the original bassist and vocalist from Spread Eagle, Rob DeLuca, and Ray West. Now, we mostly chat with Rob, but Ray pops in and surprises us at the end. We talk about their plans for a new album in 2021, their comeback album, Subway to the Stars, their killer self titled debut, and all kinds of other cool stuff. Check it out! Well, Rob, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. How are you, Mike? Hey, I'm doing awesome. Awesome. I'm ready to talk about some rock. How about you? Okay, yeah. Where are you at? Uh, I'm in uh, upstate New York. Okay, cool. Cool. What about you? Where are you? I'm in Manhattan. Oh, okay. So we're... Down, downstate New York. Okay, so we're, <laughs> we're close. <laughs> yeah, somewhat. So, hey, man, I'm seeing a lot of shots of you guys online in the studio. What are you guys up to? Well, we are writing our follow-up to Subway to the Stars, and it is going really well so far, and I'm very excited and very happy. It's always so cool to be creative and, you know, create, creating things out of, out of thin air. Is, it's, just, it's, it's a mystery to me that, that I can never, I never get tired of it because it's, it's uh it comes out of nowhere, you know, and that's what I love about music. It's one of the many things I love about music. How is the direction? Is it going to be similar to the last one? Or are you going in a different direction at all? What's going on with that? We're tr- I mean, the last record, Subway of the Stars, actually got the best reviews of our career out of all three albums, and uh, which is amazing because we wanted to. We knew we had to make a strong comeback album. You know, after all those years, you can't. Come, you know, you can't wait 20 years and come back with a, a pile, a, you know, a plate of shit. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know, we, we worked very hard on every song. It wasn't like, you know, let's focus on the singles and just fill it out with other songs. And, you know, even the deep album cuts we worked so hard on. In hindsight, I can see that, you know, because it still stands up. I, I really love the record. So I'm just feeling like I hope it's, you know, it can be as good as the last album. And as far as style it's it's aggressive and maybe it's a touch heavier than the last album but but you know it's geared towards spread eagle fans and it's we're not no we're not going to go in a crazy direction and and try to do something different um we can do that we can start a new band to do that but but spread eagle fans want spread eagle and 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 to be honest we love the spread eagle sound so it's we're not interested in, in doing anything else with, with spread eagle um, what took so long for you guys to do this comeback album? It was a slow process, you know. I was, I was playing in other bands. Ray was playing in other bands, and then in 2006, we just kind of, you know, because we broke up in like 1994 or something mm-hmm. or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. Went on break, broke up, whatever. And um, and you know, people, our fans were, were were really bugging us to get it back together, and we weren't ready. But then uh, one day. Um, I heard Broken City in a club and I was, I didn't even, I hadn't heard it in so long. I didn't know what it was, but I was like, this is amazing. You know, it didn't, it's not like the whole song went by and I didn't know who it was, but it was like about 30 seconds or something. I was like, this is incredible. Once I realized it was Spread Eagle, I was like, man, this band was so incredible. It's, I think it's time. And I called Ray and he, he was down for it. So that was around 2005 or six. We put it back together in 2006. So, um, and then we just, we had a, a different, we had a different drummer for a minute, and then we got Rick, but we had a different guitar player for a while, and then we got Zeev. And, you know, we were just, I think we just wanted to play some shows and have some fun, you know, like, we, we were, we didn't really want to get back into the grind of it yet. We weren't ready. Uh, we just wanted to have fun, so we did some touring, you know, regional touring and stuff like that. And, and then once, when we went to, Europe um, and England, things got more serious, and uh, and we had a real, we had a lot of momentum. So Frontiers approached us and we, uh, asking us if we wanted to make a record, and it 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 was time. Naturally, it was time. It, things had been slowly getting more intense and more real. And with Zeev, um, uh, Rick De Lucas unbelievable drummer and not not to slight him because when he came in it's it was amazing but still we had a great guitar player who didn't make it feel exactly like spread eagle yet and he was awesome because we could do shows and he was our buddy and it was great but when zeev came in it was like 
it sounded like Spread Eagle again with all four members giving me that feeling of what Spread Eagle was. And that was the first time I felt like this is, you know, this is like what it used to be, you know, the feeling I used to get. So that was, it must have been about 2013 or something, I'm just guessing. And then it was, then it started getting a lot better. And then when we, we started building momentum and then when we got back from Europe, uh, when Frontiers asked us, we knew we were ready. We knew we could do it. So yeah, it's, it's, it, that's a lot of time, 20 something years, but we were all in the industry working so much, you know, it's not like we were sitting at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, I watched the video for uh, Sound of Speed where you guys are at the go-kart park, and I thought that was a great idea, man. Who came up with that, that idea? That was awesome. I did. I did. Okay, I nice. Thought, with, with that song, with the, the subject matter, I figured, you know, the obvious thing to do would be us in the most badass cars and crashes and fire, and so I wanted to go the, in the exact opposite direction of that. <laughs> so, However, even though... I, you know, you asked who came up with the idea with that, of that. Um, the, the, the look of the video and the feel of it and everything was, was the director Phil Locko's idea. And like I told him we wanted to do go karts, but all, all the rest of the, that style, styling, um, the stylistic nature of the video was his, were his ideas. Let's talk about your debut. So can you believe that it was 30 years ago? I mean, where the hell has the time gone? Yeah, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. It just it goes to show how how quickly life goes by. The original UFO bassist died yesterday, and it's just like it's all so sobering, you know, how it just flies by, you know. So I guess it's a lesson to make make your mark, you yeah. know, make make art that lasts, and and do things for real. Don't do things half assed. And uh, I guess that's about you know the only lesson we can learn from all for all this because it all goes by yeah you know and it's a it's a gritty album heavy album and you guys were definitely a lot heavier than the, say the bands that came out of the, the late 80s how did that go i mean do, did you tour with some of these guys how, how did uh how did that all work out we actually we actually we didn't tour with that many bands we 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 opened up for vain before our album was out okay um and we make, basically went out and headlined you know with local openers we yeah we were a little heavier than most of those bands we weren't really a hair metal band you know no. we were more like you know we we call ourselves street metal and other people call us that you know it was like you know a little dirtier grittier version of of you know what was popular at the time and um and you know we 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 liked what we were we uh you know we were kind of had our own thing within the genre you know, a little, little nastier, a little streetier, a little meaner, a little more real. Who were some of your influences that got you to that point to, to make that sound? I would say as a band, in the years leading up to Spread Eagle's debut, our main influences were, I mean, we all had millions of influences, mm -hmm. but I'd say the big ones in general were Aerosmith, Van Halen, and Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. I'd say if I can you kind of mix yeah. those three. Um, I'd, I'd say if you mix those three, that was a big part of our sound. And then you mix in all the other dozens of influence we individually had. Now, one thing you guys were on MCA, and I've talked to tons of people about MCA. Well, were they a shitty label, or what do you think? Um, I, I don't know if they were a shitty label, but they weren't the best label. You know, they were mostly an urban label. They were a rock label in the 70s because they had The Who and they had Elton John. Well, Elton, you know, a rocker, but they had, uh, I think they had Leonard Skinner, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm I think sure you're right. Yeah, they yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. yep. Leonard Skinner, yep. they, they had The Who. So, um, but they got away from hard rock and went to like urban music and they decided to get back into it. I guess I'm just guessing probably after Guns N' Roses started selling zillions of records and they realized <laughs> yeah. they were missing out, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. But there's a learning curve to anything, you know, and they weren't really up to speed of knowing what to do with bands like, like us, you know, cause we were, you know, we obviously didn't have that pop hit that we, that, they could plug into their machine to make us big, you know? So mm -hmm. bands like Spreddy will require like a different kind of grassroots building, you know? Cause even Guns N' Roses, it took a year for their album to go to number one. True. And that's a lot of commitment and a lot of patience. Just a 
lot of people working this working the street, you know. And they didn't they didn't understand that yet. And uh so, you know, I wouldn't say they were shitty, but but you know, it could have been a lot better for us. Definitely had a few songs, uh, a few videos on Headbangers Ball. That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Headbangers was good to us, and it was great to be on MTV. You know, like you, you in the years prior, you know, you grow up dreaming to be on it, and then you then you're on it. It's pretty pretty awesome. Now, by the time you get to um, open to the public, uh, and once again, that's another great hard rock album. I, I see so many people commenting online how, how much they love that album but here we are we're in 1993 you know this is the height of grunge uh what was going on at that point with the band yeah grunge was you know grunge was popular it was was everywhere and you know we we liked a lot of the guys in spread eagle liked a lot of grunge and uh there's nothing wrong with with good music you know and and good grunge is good music you know so mm-hmm. So we had no problem with that. It's just there was one of the strangest things happened that I've ever seen in my lifetime, it, and it was um, um, an, an evolution of, or uh, it was it was regarding style, like, mm-hmm. and it, it, it was musical style and and uh, also visual style, clothing style. It's it, all of a sudden, if you weren't in a grunge band or didn't look like you're in a grunge band or weren't associated with that. Seattle movement or that West Coast movement, you sucked, and it was the strangest thing in the world because you know it's impossible for a new you know a band to come in like Nirvana say, and make the rest of the world not good. You right? Know? Yeah. It's one thing stupid. if you know if you you know hey there's a new sound dig it you know it's great you know but it, the fact that something comes in and people are acting like well anything that happened before you know this day in 1991 sucks you know it's it was really ridiculous and we were we were pretty dumbfounded by it like how could we be a band that was like building up and getting more popular and getting more fans and you know work you know working to to succeed little by little and gaining fans and doing that you know on the road to success then all of a sudden be like the the most uncool in uh, uncool band in the world you know yeah, it was totally unfair. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't realistic. It wasn't fair. It it was ridiculous. You know, like now I'm not saying that every band that that was out was great and should have survived. I'm saying when a new style comes out, you know, like what's good should be remembered as good and and should continue. And what's you know, if it's not good, that what well, shouldn't it shouldn't last anyway. You know. Mm-hmm. But it was at that point. It was like any band that wasn't a grunge band is ridiculous and is over and we and, and they were all over you know the big ones guns and roses skid row they were like no you know they, they they couldn't do anything no it was you know it was really you know you're hitting the nail on the head because you really never did see anything like that and when you think back to the 80s i, I mean think about the artists that were out in the 80s that were that were also stars in the 70s and in the 60s you got people like tina turner rod stewart mick jagger i mean you've got all the david bowie you could i mean you could go down the list and it's in rock too yeah. bands like priest and kiss uh somehow they were able to find themselves and were to be they were able to be accepted in the 80s and for some reason yeah. that mindset did not continue uh when you when you hit the 90s it, it was, was very was, strange yeah, it was very strange unusual. like not to say that there might have been a minute where tina turner or or bowie or whatever wasn't slightly out of style but right. they weren't looked at like that was the biggest mistake ever like in david bowie and tina turner it's just like yeah they they were popular a few years ago and now judas priest is in and then bowie would come back out and people would be like oh yeah i love bowie you know but uh with grunge it was this weird thing that like no one else can survive can can be in our club anymore it's only <laughs> these bands out of seattle or northern west coast you know it's really strange yeah it is what it is it and is. then and it happened for a reason whatever that is what did you do once the band ended what'd you guys do i started putting together new york bands um stretching out a little bit style stylistically you know just continuing i never stopped playing music i never you know i worked you know i was a carpenter mm-hmm. but, and uh i was a bartender but but i still was playing music every day and gigging out as you know i was always in a band or at least one band i think in like 2004 i started uh, just doing like the base for hire thing you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. and my friend ray freeman um he's a tour manager and he was 
he was tour managing uh, George Lynch, and he really wanted me to to do a tour with Lynch. And I, I wasn't really that was before I put Spread Eagle back together, and and I wasn't really ready to do like that style at the time. You know, I was really stretching out with some crazy stuff just to test the limits. Mm-hmm. And he really wanted me to do it. He was like, "You're you know you're the perfect guy for this," and he kind of kept asking me and i was like i gave him a hard time i gave him a really hard time and i did it and it was so much fun and it was so easy and i mean easy in a way that like it was natural to me you know playing heavy bass in a band without a rhythm guitar player you know um it's what i had done for years in Mm -hmm. in in spread eagle and before in that style so uh you know when it was over (laughs) i It was a joke that, you know, like I had given him such a hard time for, you know, for kind of forcing me to do it. And I had such a great time and George was, was really awesome. And, uh, at that point I started playing, you know, I, I, I was more open to play with, you know, ba- hire myself out as a bassist, which I had never even thought of. I was always a guy in a band, you know? Mm-hmm. So then I played with Joan Jett and I, and then I played with, Sebastian and then Sebastian led the UFO. One thing always led to the next thing, you know. To answer your question, I was always playing. How'd you end up meeting uh, Mr. Bach? Well, he he liked Spread Eagle, and he he said some nice things about us in the press in 1990 or 1991, which we really appreciated because you know skids were on top of the world at that moment, and um, and that was really cool of him to do that. And he came up on stage and sung Broken City with us in like 1990 or 1991. So, um, you know, we, we became friends back then. We weren't real close, but we were friends and we didn't stay real close in touch, but we, we did stay in touch. And then at one point in like, oh, oh, five. Yeah, it was oh, five. He, told me that Steve DiGiorgio was, was going to be leaving his band and he, he needed a bassist. So, uh, so I was, I was psyched to, to join his band and I'm, I still am psyched to be there. Awesome. It sounds like the, uh, the Jericho feud has, has died down. So maybe they can be buddies again, huh? <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I don't think there's, this business is so hard. It's without fighting, you know, it makes it even <laughs> right. harder when, when you have to like choose sides, you know? The problem, too, is, uh, you know, there's a lot of clickbait and all that kind of stuff out there. You know, a lot of times there's a one-sentence soundbite that, you know, you read it, but you don't have any context that, of what was said before it. And sometimes that can come across as offensive. Now, I'm not saying with the Sebastian Jericho thing that there wasn't some direct statements, but but you know what I'm talking about. When you look at a lot of these rock yeah. sites, there's a lot of just one-liners that people can take the wrong way. And I get it. It, it drives people to, uh, to to the site. It drives them to, you know, look into the article and find out more about the band. So it works. But, you know, I think somewhere along the line, there's some heads bought when, when you get those things happening. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, we should all be supportive of each other. But um, I, I see, I don't I don't know Chris. I don't know his music. But I do see Baz's point about, about the the tracks it's sure. getting ridiculous with bands it's just getting really ridiculous and um and Baz he he's he's all over the stage and he still sings damn well and if you listen to a song like American Metalhead um uh it's it's one of his solo songs mm-hmm. it's, you know one of his solo albums and he's just up like his singing is like so incredible and he does that without any backing tracks and it's hard, and and it's 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 frustrating to him to hear people doing it with backing tracks and acting like they're not, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I'm, I don't know if Chris does because I haven't even listened to it uh, his stuff because because I know what, doing interviews people would be asking me about this stuff, so I consciously stay away from Chris's music. <laughs> but because uh, I don't want to talk about him, you know. Right. Like if someone calls me about an interview, I'll talk about me, you know. Yeah, my exactly. stuff, the bands I have gone on, but um, but I will say that what what Baz does, what what Spread Eagle does, what UFO does, it's it's rock and roll. It's it's dangerous. Anything could happen. There are no tracks ever on any of those bands, and there never was, and never will be. And and it's like it's this particular art form of guys going out on the road for like forty days and honing their craft and being the best they can, and like kind of fine-tuning the machine you know and um 
it's hard. It's dangerous. It's rock and roll. It's dangerous. It's and it's hard because it's hard to be consistent. You know, we're humans and we're all we're all inconsistent animals. Mm-hmm. So so that's that's the, what we're chasing is to be out. And if it goes somewhere unexpected, hey man, that's that's what rock and roll is, and that's that's what it should be. It should be dangerous, you know. So what's frustrating to me is these bands, and there's millions of them that run tracks and tracks if for you know for your listeners basically they take the digital tracks from their album and they play them along to they play to them in concert the drummer the drummer syncs up to a click track in his ears and syncs up to the tracks and the band plays the live band plays to the drummer so if everything goes smooth the band is playing and the live tracks are playing all in sync you know mm-hmm and but it's gotten so ridiculous where bands are using so many tracks like you know at first it was maybe just like a deep keyboard pad to fill it out or a couple backing vocals and now it's like all these millions of backing vocals there's deep guitars and things that that aren't even people there aren't even people on stage you know playing those parts (laughs) you know it's just it's just ridiculous, you know, and uh, I think a lot of bands just rely on that. And, and, and my long winded point is that that's not rock and roll. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just something different. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like a it's like rock performance. Yeah, I definitely can't stand when you can hear the let's say if it's the lead singer's vocals, you know, on the backing track. So he'll sing a line and then you can still hear his voice in the backing track. I mean, I definitely not a fan of that at all. Well, if if people going to concerts knew how prevalent it was they would look at live concerts a lot differently because it's incredibly prevalent and and i feel that should say on the ticket that this band is performing with backing tracks because a, a, a person going to see a band should have a right to make that decision if they want to see something live you know if they're being sold that, that that they're seeing something live then you know they should know what they're seeing you know, if it's just, it might be 80% live, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so I understand Sebastian or anyone's frustration because it frustrates the hell out of me too. Because what we do is not rock performance. It's, it's live rock and roll, you know, and it's very hard, especially hard for a singer. I could see how a singer would be the most frustrated by it because I can pick up my bass and it sounds a exactly the way it sounds 99% of the time but mm-hmm. your voice every day sounds different you know yeah. a little different depending on how you slept how much you drank how many shows in a row you did you yeah. know how what point of the tour you're in you know there's so many factors in, in singing you know so I think people when they see these bats or whatever you want to call them maybe if they knew what's involved in it and what's at stake they might look at it a little differently yeah exactly so when we talk about the new spread eagle material what are you thinking sometime next year or i know it's hard with everything that's going on in the world but is that the is that the game plan yeah i would think i would think sometime in 2021 yeah Perfect. yeah that sounds very realistic well let's hope man keep our fingers crossed that everything kind of gets straightened out in the world and uh we can get back to rocking and doing shows and all that good stuff Fingers crossed. I hope so. I think it's going to. I think it's going to happen. I mean, they will find a vaccine, and they will put this behind us. And um, hopefully, everyone will take it because the more people take the vaccine, the quicker we can do shows. Um, but I'll bet uh, a lot of venues won't let you in if you don't have some kind of proof that you had the va- vaccine, etc. Yeah. Hey, Mike, you there? Yeah. Ray's on the line. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ray. How you doing, man? Good, man. Good. I'm chiming in a little, a, little, a little late, but I figured I'd just say hi. <laughs> no problem. We covered a lot of the questions, but some of them were geared uh, directly at you, so I'll hit you with those. How's that sound? Sure. Sounds great. Well, man, hey, uh, I think you got an awesome voice. Uh, it, it's a nasty voice in a lot of ways, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, who's some of your influences that, that gave you that voice? Oh, man, that's like everything you know, growing up, whether it's Steve Marriott, James Brown, Stevie Wonder, that, that's that kind of list, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, uh, I, I have a, I, li- I love soul music and I love rock and roll, you know? I don't, th- I think um, through the years there's just been so many, it's hard to really like pinpoint one influence, it's just I'm a really like, I'm a gumbo of a lot of things, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, yeah definitely. What do you think about 30 years since your debut album, do you believe it or what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time coming, man. You know, this, this band, Rob has been out you know, doing his thing, and, and I've been sort of doing mine. It, it's great to come together and just, just, and have such a cool, you know, a, a, 
a cool batch of songs, and we're really, we're really proud of the work that we did. So it's a great thing that you know we're still around, and years later we're still able to, to kick this stuff around. It's 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 an awesome thing. And the fact that people still want to hear us, it's wonderful. That's a mind blower because you know yeah. some people just aren't you know the people fall by the wayside. And you once you're once you're out of earshot, you're just gone. So it's nice to have a lot of friends that's still around and, and and care enough to to help push the band as much as you know as much as we do. Yeah, I mean this this genre of music has a lot of hardcore fans. And it's definitely been rediscovered by the younger generation. You know what I mean? You always you always see a young kid with a ACDC shirt on or a young kid with a Kiss shirt. You know what I mean? So this, you know, hard rock it just continues. And and really there's not a lot of new hard rock for people to gravitate to. So they do end up you know, looking up the classic bands and discovering them. Yeah, I think what we do is, you know, it's, it's not an ancient art form. I think it's, you know, the, the, core of, the core of what rock and roll is, having a good time and, and playing great music is what is, 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 the, is at the core of everything. Everything. So that's. I think it still exists. I think good music is, will attract will attract you know listeners. I think you know a, a good rock song is a good rock song. Good rock band is a good rock band. But the audience is always going to be there for it. For sure, I well, agree. I well, agree. What do you guys want to say to your fans out there in closing? Well, I personally, you know, just thanks for everybody that's been like so positive and 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 did behind us and very supportive and, and still you know hung in there with us and they're still around and and spread the word. And, uh, you know, you need, we're, we're, I think we're a sincere bunch of, of people. So we, we do our best to put forth an honest effort. And, uh, I hope people understand that we're like, we're for real. So we've done our best to present, you know, great music and, and, and we all enjoy each other's company. So this kind of band attracts, you know, a, a healthy rock and roll listener. So we're, we're grateful for everybody, for all the help, for all the support. You know, it's, it's a privilege just to play rock and roll. And, uh, I'm happy just to still be in the mix. I agree with everything Ray said, and I'd like to say our our fans are geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> They're the smartest rock fans in the world. Spread Eagle fans are the smartest music fans in the world. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, guys, hey, Where's man. John Einstein. I wish you guys a lot of luck with everything you're going to be doing next year, and uh, send it my way, and I'll make sure I share it on all, all my pages. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. Okay. Take care, Stay buddy. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Well, it was great chatting with the guys from Spread Eagle. Hey, I know in 2020, a lot of things just haven't made sense this year. But you know what does make sense? is following 80s Glam Metal on Twitter, liking the 80s Glam Metal cast on Facebook, and subscribing to the 80s Glam Metal cast on YouTube. That's what makes sense. Rock on!